Hello, Faculty Factory listeners. It's your friendly podcast producer just to remind you that the Faculty Factory is now on Twitter. Find us at faculty underscore factory. So if you're on Twitter, please find us there and we will make sure to follow you back. We want to keep in touch with our community. You're on the Faculty Factory podcast and I'm Kim Skorupski from Hopkins. And with us today on the podcast is Miss Penny Edwards, MSBS. Am I correct, Penny? You are, yes. All right. Penny has a very interesting story to tell us today because she, as a director of faculty development for a whole whopping year Mm -hmm. at USC Greenville, has had an interesting journey as a faculty member bouncing around back and forth and now finds herself building and leading a new program at USC. So first of all, kudos, thank you to my colleague and friend, Angela Sharkey at Wake, who told me about Penny and bragged up and down and down and up and all around about the great work you're doing. And Penny, you were kind enough to share with me that you've been really learning a lot from all the wisdom and all the the friends who've been sharing their journeys and stories and lessons on the podcast. So would you mind, you tell us who you are and what you're doing currently, and then can you just clue us into this interesting life journey of yours and how you found yourself in faculty affairs and and what's arrived to you as being something you figured out and things you're still struggling with? Sure. No, thank you so much, Kim. I'm gracious and so happy to be here uh, for this experience. And definitely a shout out to Dr. Angela Sharkey uh, for connecting us. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, oh, goodness, where to start? Uh, so I have been in the role of Director of Faculty Development for a little over a year at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville. As some of you probably know, we also have a School of Medicine in Columbia that is part of our flagship institution of the state, University of South Carolina. And so that is a sister school of ours. Um, And so in my role here in uh, Greenville, um, as I said, I've been here for uh, a pull over a year. Pause. Tell everybody also the very unique thing about you and Greenville. What is this this life story of yours? Oh, yes. Okay. Because you're so unique in many ways, but this is a really interesting thing about you. (laughs) Well, I was actually born in Greenville. Really? Uh, Yes. I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, moved around back and forth uh, from here to Florida and back and forth and have settled once again in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, And so it is a a bit of an interesting journey. Um, I So you you mentioned uh, my credentials there with a master's degree and a bachelor's degree. And the reason for that is because they're in different disciplines. I went to undergrad here in South Carolina and got two bachelor's degrees, one in biology and one in psychology. Couldn't make up my mind. And so I started out doing some molecular genetics research for a while, got a couple publications out of that, then switched lanes and moved into a clinical psychology PhD program at the University of Florida. Did that for a while, earned my master's degree in clinical health psychology, worked with the Center for Pain Research and Behavioral Health there at what was then known as Shands Teaching Hospital, Uh, engaged with uh, lots of patients dealing with chronic pain, um, did some clinical work, things of that nature. Uh, And then, you know, life has a tendency to uh, impact our trajectories, and so At the time, I I found myself and my then husband with child, as they say. So I gave birth to my daughter. No, my husband was not with child, thankfully. No, no, just me. But, you know, the whole thing that both of us together. Yes, Um, I was the one with child. So that's that's an excellent uh, clarifying point there, Kim. Thank you. Um, (laughs) And so uh, after my daughter was born, we decided that, well, I kind of decided that, you know, I thought we should probably raise our child rather than some strangers. Uh, And so I made the very difficult decision to leave my doctoral program. And this was, gosh, um, wow, probably almost 20 years ago. Uh, And so from that point, I moved into higher education and I began teaching And I fell in love with the teaching role and being a faculty member. So I taught so many psychology classes in higher education in the technical college system here in the state of South Carolina. Just absolutely just 
really found a passion for teaching, for connecting with my students, uh, taking the world of psychology and helping them understand what that was, what it meant for them, what it meant for their, their lives and their relationships, and just really gravitated towards that and kind of immersed myself into that world. Uh, my daughter, of course, grew and is now 17 years old. And yes, it, it's, it's quite a, a little unnerving, actually, at times. It's unnerving, um, especially folks, you don't see this because Penny looks like she's 22. But anyway. Oh, yeah, she's well, to, yeah, that's thank you for that compliment. <laughs> Hello. But no, so I, I, I worked as a faculty member for 15 years. I became course coordinator for our entire general psychology uh, courses for the college that I worked at. I engaged in a a good bit of faculty development work over the years. I became department chair of social sciences and did that for several years, worked with faculty on performance evaluation. So this is where the bit of a faculty affairs piece kind of comes in, Uh, worked on onboarding, helped faculty with mentoring, engaging in their teaching practice, developing their teaching practice. Uh, One of my favorite things about that experience was taking Uh, people in their discipline, whether it was psychology or another discipline in social sciences, sociologists, for example, Kim. Yes. Um, (laughs) And so one of my favorite uh, experiences there were were to, to work with these people who had never taught and they wanted to engage in that kind of work. And so I would be the person who would take a bit of a chance and I would hire the individual who had very little teaching experience in a, in a part-time or adjunct role and then work with them tremendously over a period of time to hone those skills. And so I, I very much saw this as you kind of, you hire for certain characteristics and then you train for the skills. So I I really looked for the people who had those inherent characteristics that we want to find in our high quality and effective teachers and then work with them to build their teaching practice skills. And I just loved that work. Um, I realized over time that that kind of work is not necessarily the same or as effective when you happen to also be that person's supervisor and have to engage in the work of managing. And as we know, managing and leading are not the same. And so I eventually kind of moved in more into the faculty development world and designing programs, workshops, facilitating these engagements, um, doing some more consulting, instructional consulting with our faculty, and just, uh, just kind of really kind of redeveloped a passion there. Um, I felt like I had, uh, I don't want to say maximize my teaching practice because I don't think that's ever possible. I think we continue to grow and continue to learn. Um, But I had reached a point where I had done all the things. I had attended all the trainings. I'd gotten the certificates. I'd gotten an online teaching certificate and had done all of these things and was like, okay, I I want more. I, I want to do something else. I want to expand this experience. I want to find something else I'm passionate about. So this was probably maybe, I don't know, I might call it my third career change in my life. And so I really just kind of dove into the faculty development world, became connected with national organizations, uh, the pod network, for example, uh, and and just kind of bolster those connections at other institutions, reaching out to folks that I knew at Clemson University, Vanderbilt University, um, University of South Carolina in in our region here in the Southeast, and uh, started looking for jobs that would more firmly put me in the faculty development world, because sometimes to do the things that you are passionate about and to be promoted, sometimes you have to leave Mm -hmm. the institution you're at. And I was in that kind of a a situation. Uh, So I applied for a few jobs. I had a couple interviews, uh, didn't really go anywhere. And then this opportunity presented itself here at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, Greenville. And I thought, oh, well, that's close by, but it's in an entirely different world than I'm accustomed to and I'm familiar with. And I will have to go back near 20 years to my prior doctoral journey and, oh, okay, I'm sure the clinical learning environment and clinical medicine has changed, <laughs> hopefully, in 20 years. Um, in the meantime, because I am I was still searching and kind of really wanting to, to grow that learning and, and expand my passion, I, I started a, a PhD program. Uh, So I'm also pursuing a PhD now, uh, and this is in learning sciences. 
I wanted to take my passion for teaching, um, all of the various kind of pieces that I'd gotten from certificate programs and various trainings and things of that nature nationally and regionally, and really coalesce that under something that gave me the space and the time to, to go deeper into the theory. And because I felt like I had a lot of the application and um, had some leadership training and leadership skills, and I really wanted to go deeper into the theory and then find ways to apply that moving forward. So I'm actually in my third year of my PhD program now. Um, thank you. <laughs> and it's been so wonderful and so exciting. Uh, and I've seen so much overlap uh, as I've been moving into this role here at uh, U of SC Greenville. And it's uh, it's been quite the journey. Um, from day one, I think in the first month after starting here, and I started in January of 2021, so a little over a year ago, mm-hmm. um, I was introduced to the Faculty Factory podcast. Yeah. I honestly do not recall how that introduction occurred, but once I found it, I was like, oh my goodness, and now's when my Southern accent's going to come out a little bit. Yeah. Oh my goodness, here it is. Th- this is what I need. <laughs> And so um, Dr. Sharkey was here at the time as our senior associate dean of academic affairs. And I talked with her about it. And she's like, oh, yes. I, yeah. So that was kind of the start of it. And I just voraciously started listening to this podcast. And I found it to be so informative and so helpful to to gain some insight into what is this world and where can I identify those transferable skills? Um, Thinking about my department chair experience, thinking about the strategic planning I had done at my prior institution, thinking about the academic leadership team environment, thinking about national councils I had served on as a faculty advocate. Where are those transferable skills into this faculty affairs and development world? And what can I bring to the table? Um, And I'm so grateful uh, that Dr. Sharkey saw a lot of these uh, transferable skills and was very much like, yes, we we want you. Um, And so that was very exciting. Um, She, as you know, has uh, moved on to a different position at Wake Forest, and we're very excited for her. I know she's enjoying her her time there and all of her excitement there. And our office here has... You'll be back on the podcast. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Um, And our office here has continually evolved and changed uh, with different roles and things of that nature. And so just recently, uh, we announced a new uh, associate dean for faculty affairs and development. We have not had someone in that role for, I would say, possibly 15 to 18 months. There has only been myself. Uh, director of faculty development. And uh, over the year that I've been in this role, I was assigned a direct report, uh, a wonderful administrative coordinator to assist with some faculty development work, who also does some faculty affairs work and who also does some CME work. Um, so I'd say, yeah, for the last year or so, it's been kind of an office of one and a half, maybe. Um, and so now we have a new associate dean, and that is Dr. Allison McGregor. And she has just recently come on board. So that might be another name for you later on down the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have been so grateful that the Faculty Factory podcast is in existence and the work that you've done, Kim, and the folks that you have interviewed, because it has been incredibly helpful for me to gain insight into what does this role look like here in academic medicine and where are there things that that we can move the needle forward? Um And so I've been developing programs, working with our faculty, both clinically, as well as our biomedical sciences faculty to identify programs, develop programs. There's a couple that we've been working on um, this year that I'm really excited about uh, that I'm happy to share if you want me to go down that road now. I I would love to go down that road. You, I'm going to give, make this your thing to remember because I'll, I'm going to forget because there's so many other things (laughs) I want to talk about. So yes, please put a pin in it as it were with these new programs. But I want to back up and, first of all, say thank you for your honesty (laughs) and and just being so transparent and open and sharing your personal life story. And as my best friend from South Carolina says, well, bless your heart. And I'm not sure what she means when she says that to me all the time. (laughs) But (laughs) Just a little tidbit, Kim. That's not always a positive thing. I recently learned that. Yeah. (laughs) But you are so refreshing. And I really, really, um, 
admire your your honesty and being open up and sharing with us your your journey. And a couple of things popped out to me that speak to um, leadership qualities, and and the they came up in two different ways. And the first time was when you talked about hiring for qualities or characteristics, and then mm-hmm. training for skills. That I think we could probably have a whole podcast episode on that. We're talking about you know oh, sure. strengths and needs, and I mean um, not needs but strengths and Myers Briggs, and <laughs> and just having someone who has like an, an intrinsic sense of motivation. I just think that was really a, a keen observation of how. Um, sometimes you might have someone who meets all the qualifications, but they have a really bad attitude or, or mm-hmm. aren't a good cultural fit. So I love the way you flipped that and reminded us to look for values, common mm-hmm. value, core values, yes. you know, vision, personality characteristics or traits that point to someone who's going to fit in. And then you do train them the skills. So you can talk about that more, but you said that in two different ways. And the other way you demonstrated your leadership mm-hmm. expertise was when you talked about these transferable skills and mm-hmm. how you were not um, hamstrung or shy or reticent about jumping because you had an ability to see how, oh, as a fill in the blank, all the roles you've had in the places where you've worked, the things you've done were able to move and duplicate and mirror in other ways. So I think those are at least two yes. really important lessons for leaders that all faculty members and all leaders who are listening to this, I hope you heard that like I did, that it was really um Sometimes it's hard to train on that and hard mm-hmm. to learn how to hire people and then also ha- how to have an awareness and an ability to step back and say, oh, I could never do that. I mean, that's impossible. That's right. I, I don't know anything about that. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. You've done A, B, and C. Oh, yeah, but that was over there. Well, wait, a <laughs> wait a minute. P- communication is communication. Building right. relationship skills. Teaching is teaching. Let's just pause. We can certainly boom, boom. So kudos to you for for that and i'm not done but i just wanted to pause there and give you a moment to, if you wanted to amplify or refute anything i just said there about leadership well, I, I will add one thing uh to, to the latter part of that in that in terms of those transferable skills a, a lot of times i think sometimes we are our own worst enemy in that regard in the sense that we think oh like you said i can't i can't do that that's a that's a different scenario my my skills don't don't apply and I think sometimes we, as you said, we we really need to take a step back and kind of level set in some ways and be like, oh, but but wait a minute, there there are aspects of the work that we're doing that at their core are the same things. They're the same characteristics. And those are the same kinds of things that you need in any kind of relationship building enterprise. And I believe in many ways, faculty development is that. It's a relationship building enterprise. Wow. And we we need to to think about it that way. And so I would just encourage others, and I will speak to myself when I say this, because I do this still, is, is to, to not, as you say, hamstring ourselves in that try to take a step back and, and look for those transferable skills, because there are qualities that are relevant in any environment, regardless of what that environment is. Mm-hmm. And if we can do that, then we can really empower ourselves to do something pretty miraculous, I think. Thank you. The second thing, Penny Edwards, I wanted to point out that you said that really popped out at me was sometimes you have to leave. And Mm -hmm. that got me down the road of appreciating how multifaceted and complex we all are. Yes. I see so many faculty members who seem to have been like had these blinders on and they're marching through in linear fashion thou shalt, you know, this degree, that certificate, that residency, that fellowship, that postdoc, that degree, that degree, and this institution, that institution, this rank, that rank, and just boom, 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 plowing through with his eyes so focused. And then, as you said so beautifully, life can sometimes just come in there and boom, (laughs) you may may find um, uh, yourself with whatever. And, And then you go, oh, no, someone who maybe doesn't have that 
I don't know what that is. It's so many that's that could be that sense of calm or like non-anxious presence. Like I got this would be like, oh no, if I can't do this, then what will I be? I'm nothing. Ah, the world is falling. Um, all is lost. All is lost. But rather you said, okay, um, this PhD program, we're going to have to maybe put this aside. There's something more important about to enter the world. And it's not a couple of letters after my name. No. And I'm going to go back. A four-year-old with- after my <laughs> 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 and, and you just said what else do or what in addition to this I also am gifted at love to do talented at skilled at trained at enjoy mm-hmm. doing and then as a pivot and isn't it interesting how that pivot to some people could have just slain them completely yeah. immobilized them that that resilience that grit you know whatever it was made you go yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go here. And now here you find yourself alone without, you know, big associate dean leadership, all program director, (laughs) director of faculty, doing it on your own uh, and figure it out. And by the way, yeah, getting getting your PhD all at the right age of 22. So like talk talk, talk about, I'll pause there. Mother, I think you've given a bunch of lessons and I just wanted to make sure people heard those lessons that, when, you know, when things get tough, wow, you know, don't dismiss it and just run around with rose colored glasses, but look at there. Here's a clear, another clear example. I have a, sim- a similar life career story of just being able to roll and we got so much in us that here you go. Mm-hmm. It's a win. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it's exciting. It's also scary. Uh, to completely pivot your career, your profession, uh, enter into a new uh, domain that is one that you're not familiar with, or at least haven't been in in 20 years or anything of that nature. Uh, And and I have to say, there are some amazing people that work here at the U of SC School of Medicine in Greenville. And I've made connections with our folks um, in Columbia at our main university, our Center for Teaching Excellence. We have some amazing folks there. Um, our sister school in Columbia, we have uh, some folks there that are my counterparts that are equally amazing and have been wonderful and have been very welcoming. Um, our health system here, Prisma Health, uh, we they have a learning and organizational development unit, and I have made connections with them and built relationships with them. And so whenever we all kind of sit down to think about, well, what is it that our faculty need? We now have a a sort of a network, um, sort of, I guess, an internal South Carolina network in some ways between the health system and our two medical schools and our university's center for for teaching um, to kind of say, okay, well, what do we have, you know, that we can we can pull from to create uh, something that's going to be worthwhile, something that's going to further the mission of the school and and really kind of meet our faculty where they are uh, and and kind of to, to get them where they want to be um, as they're moving forward. And so I think that that relationship building is, as I, that phrase I used, it's a relationship building enterprise. Um, I think it's a it's really important that we that we focus on that, um, especially with everything that's been going on over the last couple of years. And I think grace is, is so important for us to to make sure that we give ourselves and others. Well, I want to underline that. So Penny, again, another good learning lesson here. If somebody were to do have to put together a wordle based on the (laughs) words that you've been saying, it's relationships, connections, connections, relationships. Another important reminder, as you point out, Penny, during a pandemic, you're not alone. We're not alone. We can feel like we're alone. Mm, And it certainly feels like we're carrying the weight of the world on our own shoulders and yeah, a lot of we feel like, well, this is on me, what's happening or not happening. And yet you are underlining the importance of connecting, finding other people, seeing what they're doing, what they've already done, what they want to mm-hmm. do, what someone has resources to do, what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And all that just takes an incredible burden off of faculty members who may wrongly feel like it's on them. It's all on you. Like all this rests on you. And I hope nobody ever, ever feels that way, but I I suspect some people do. And I love how you really reinforce this idea relationships, a relationship building exercise. Even if you're not in faculty affairs and faculty development, life isn't life, a relationship building exercise. Sure. (laughs) Penny, tell us about these, a couple programs you've put together, built, developed, assembled, evaluated. What's going on there? (laughs) 
Uh, well, I, I will say I have my whiteboard over here to the right. And so there's everything there. Um, but I'll focus on just a couple of the things that I, I think uh, I'm most excited about. Uh, so early on in my time here, um, <laughs> literally about a month after I began, uh, I, I learned that there was a, a very long um faculty development week that was offered to our faculty. And I was asked to um, look at ways that we could modify that to maybe shorten it, make it a little bit more focused. And so uh, basically within the first three months of my role, I had to put together a, a three-day faculty development kind of conference um, with our faculty. And the experience of doing that is, um, allowed me to build connections with these different places that I've already mentioned, and of course, with our faculty. And so I took um, some elements from those sessions. I, I led a couple of listening sessions uh, within that kind of conference, if you will, uh, to gain some feedback from faculty on what their needs were and what kinds of things would they like to see moving forward. And one of the, the most common responses I, I heard was, we really want faculty development that matches onto what we're doing in terms of teaching learners, teaching our students, and that has that medical education lens. You know, if we're going to do something internal, if we're going to build something, you know, from the ground up, we really want it to be focused on, on what we need. And uh, I was like, okay. So myself and uh, my counterpart in Columbia, the director of faculty development there, um, Donna Ray, and uh, our Center for Teaching Excellence partner uh, in Columbia, Casey Carroll, excellent instructional designer. The three of us kind of got together. And so we built a program called Reflective Teaching Practices for Medical Educators, RTP for me. Oh, clever. For I love clever yes. wordplay. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Well, you got to have a little bit of wordplay when you're trying to, you know, come up with program names. I just think of that course. adds a little bit there. Fun. Um, so we took the two medical schools and we took the two faculty development directors and uh, our instructional designer contact at the CTE and said, okay, let's put this together. So we leveraged a course frame that the CTE had in existence in their repertoire of, of programming. And we completely kind of, I don't want to say blew it up and retooled it because um, we didn't quite blow it up, uh, but we retooled it and layered everything into that program that was specific for medical educators. So it was a five week blended program we had asynchronous content in their learning management system, which for us is Blackboard. Mm -hmm. And then we had interactive webinars uh, three times during that five-week period. And then another layer to this blended programming is we paired up all of the faculty participants with an instructional designer with the Center for Teaching Excellence. Mm -hmm. And part of their um, commitment to this program were to go through the asynchronous modules in Blackboard, attend the live interactive webinars that we facilitated, and then consult with their instructional designer to design a teaching project of their very own. Mm -hmm. So it was a highly individualized program in terms of the teaching project. Every faculty member that participated could choose whatever they wanted to do in terms of their teaching project, whether it was uh, revamping a particular lecture or set of slides, looking at an entire module, whether it was looking at some curriculum changes. Um, and this program was open to both biomedical sciences educators as well as physician faculty. We had 18 participants. Um, actually, I take that back. It was 17 participants that finished the program. And it was a mix of, again, both basic sciences and physicians from both medical schools. Huh. So we had lots of relationship building, not only across the basic sciences and the physicians, but also across both medical schools. Yeah. Um, and so there were activities and things for them to do within the asynchronous modules. There were the interactive facilitated webinars and then the instructional design consultation. And so it was a very robust program. Um, it went off really, really well. Uh, we pulled in like all the literature that we pulled in to the asynchronous modules came from medical education literature, looking at um, reflective practices. We kind of leveraged some of the reflective practices that are talked about in medicine and pulled that into the teaching environment. And how do you apply that to your teaching practice? We talked about building your teaching philosophy and how would you incorporate that into like a promotion packet? 
Um, so we kind of tried to tie everything together to what was very relevant to to our faculty right. uh, based on what they said they they needed and wanted. Wow. Um, yeah. Did, do you have a sense that those projects were real projects that they had then applied and oh, put yes. out or was it they weren't like these just kind of checking the box? Oh, no. They, they I'll give you a couple of examples. Right away, right? Oh, that's oh my gosh. Cool. They were amazing. Um, we had a basic sciences uh, faculty member who decided that she wanted to change how the students were uh, kind of taking notes on information for, um, I believe it was a biochemistry class, um, and uh, how they were taking notes on this information. And so she created basically uh, a template of notes. And the students had to fill in this template over the course of the module to where by the time they were done, they had this complete, this completed like metabolic map wow. and this completed set of notes at the end. And so she, she, she basically used scaffolding to create this assignment. And it was a, an approach that she had not done quite the same way before. And so she modified it for her class and she has been using it this year. Huh. Um, we had a, uh, and this leads into the second program. If we have time, I would love to tell you about exactly. one of our physician um, faculty is a residency program director at uh, one of our family practice areas here. And he wanted to use the, <laughs> the structure of the RTP for me program to create some faculty development programming for his residency faculty. So <laughs> His teaching project was to kind of riff off of the RTP for me program and create a RTP modified for program. Them. An yes, RTP exactly. For them. Um, and, and make a, a program for his residency faculty. Uh, and so that is the other program that I would love to tell you about. Imitation uh, is the sincerest form of flattery, right? And he was just yeah, absolutely. Like, put it right out there. I'm going to take this. <laughs> do this, but I'm going to put it over there and talk about it. Transferable skills. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what he did. And he was very upfront about it. He was like, this is, it's Dr. Aaron Zeller. He's our, our residency program director in our um, Oconee family medicine practice here, uh, which is a, like a local County, um, like two counties over. Uh, but yeah, he was, he was completely upfront about it. And at the end of the RTP for me program, uh, we gave space to all the faculty participants to present to the group their teaching project and what they had done. Um, Because one of the things that we know from teaching practices and education is that it's important to present your work. It's it's important to kind of give back and and to connect with your colleagues in that way. And so we gave people the space to do that and they could either do it in a webinar format or they could do it via some kind of, you know, digital poster uh, within the asynchronous space and the learning management system, whatever they felt comfortable with. We tried to build a tremendous amount of flexibility into this program so that people could get out of it what they really wanted to right. get out of it. And, I, um, and celebrating success. So that's so important. Yes. It's always important to share the the science of it or the, the tool, the resource, yes. but also to celebrate an achievement and accomplishment. Mm-hmm. But bless his heart, what did he do? <laughs> So every member of the program, I will say, earned a certificate for their involvement and completion of their teaching project. And several of them are still talking about this. We are uh, we just announced uh, the second iteration of RTP for me uh, to occur this coming summer, and so we're very excited that that's happening. Mm-hmm. But so the the person who um, excellently riffed off of RTP for me is, like I said, Dr. Aaron Zeller, a wonderful program director out there. And so he took the outline of RTP for me, modified it, and tweaked it a bit. And created what he called the details faculty development series and details is another acronym of course it is so <laughs> details is developing excellent teachers and integrating learning sciences whoa that took a lot of work i want to play boggle with you guys <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So the details program, and we had a whole team of um, physician faculty that sort of assisted in putting this together. Uh, This program was designed, uh, the details program was designed to be pretty much a nine month to year long kind of program where uh, Dr. Zeller and his crew kind of took 20 minute chunks out of faculty meetings that were already scheduled. So they're leveraging existing time on the books. Mark. So 20 minutes out of a faculty meeting twice a month from October through June. Okay. So we just started this program in October a few months ago. Right. Uh, we're 
almost to the middle point. And he has been, we've been rotating facilitators of this discussion. Uh, Some of the physicians have been facilitating. He's been facilitating. I've helped with a couple of them and I've been supporting them sort of on the back end with a lot of the programmatic elements. Um, We've leveraged our, I guess, learning management system that our CME office uses, which is Ethos. And we've leveraged that as uh, an evaluation tool for this program. So you have these 20 minutes, 15 minutes of the 20 minutes is a facilitated discussion. And it, this is done in kind of a flipped classroom environment or an inverted classroom environment, leveraging that, that tool. We provide folks with pre-reads um, several days to a week before the faculty development conversation and ask them some targeted questions about those pre-reads. And this group is amazing. Uh, They read over this material. This is kind of a pilot program. They read over this material. They come to the the faculty meeting. And then we have some pointed questions, really trying to get them to dig into where do they see these concepts? And these are all teaching practice concepts, learning sciences concepts. Where do they see these concepts in the GME space? Where do they see that in their residents um, and the work that they're doing with their residents and the teaching that they're doing with them, whether it's at the bedside, whether it's, you know, charting, whatever the case may be, where can they find elements of backwards design? Where can they find elements of thinking about critical conversations? Where can they find elements, you know, of this reflective practice? Where can they find it in the space that they're in? How have they used it? And I'll say that for most of these folks, they are already doing a lot of these things but now they have a terminology to apply to it. They're like, oh, that's what that is. And sharing each other and and saying, oh, brilliant. And find little little nuanced tidbits and ways of doing Mm -hmm. things that kind of go, oh, I can transfer that to my area, my school. Exactly. Exactly. And in the last five minutes of that 20 minute section, uh, we have them log in to their, their ethos account And this is where they get credit. We've got this tied to um, AMA, CME credit for them. So they can go in and they can claim their credit. Um, And then there are two tasks that they have while they're in the system. We are asking them to capture a teaching pearl for every one of these sessions. And so they're going to have a strand of teaching pearls Mm -hmm. by the end of this program. And on the back end in the Office of Faculty Development, we are tracking their pearls so that at the end of this program, we can present them with a report that has all of their teaching pearls from the entire program. And we're going to help them build that into maybe a teaching philosophy if they wish to do that. And then they can put it in their faculty portfolio to help with their promotions and appointment processes and things of that nature. Oh my gosh. Now just pause here. (laughs) Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Because this is genius. Not only do I love the metaphor of the pearls and the strand of pearls, and that's mm-hmm. a beautiful picture, but what, what a way to capitalize on a learning nugget, a learning moment yep. for the learner, also for the instructors, what are they learning? And what is mm-hmm. not, we work so hard on this part of the rubric and nobody even mentioned this as a pearl. So it helps us evaluate our curriculum and the process and, and what the students are learning. And then you wrap it all up. And then as an extra bonus, not only do you give them their strand of pearls so that they can go, oh, wow, that's right. I, I did learn a lot there. But then it's packaged so that they can immediately plunk it into an annual review, a promotion yep. document, that is like win, 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 win. Smoke. Yeah. How did you think of that? Well, I mean, it's strategic faculty development. You tie it to what the needs are and what the processes are that are built into the faculty affairs. Oh, Penny, why don't you just say duh? So like, <laughs> it's obvious, like duh, isn't it obvious? Hello. It's <laughs> obvious to a lot of us don't do that. We get stuck up in a bureaucracy and we (laughs) think we see the value of that, but try talking to the IT people, try talking to the modern people, try talking to the Blackboard people. So (laughs) you figured it out. So I think that uh, paper should be called, duh. (laughs) That is so amazing. I'm so thrilled to see the evolution 
mm-hmm. of something at the granular granular level all the way up and then wrapping right around and closing the loop. That's oh, there's one more piece. Of course. Oh, naturally, naturally. <laughs> In this strand of pearls, there's some beautiful medallion. Right? What is we- it? Well, I don't know when this podcast will be aired and if these folks will be listening, but we do have something for them that is tangible with regards to pearls. Uh, oh, I'll make sure. Of- I'll make sure the timing is right. Go. <laughs> <laughs> we do have something for them. In addition to their certificate, they're going to have a little a little pearl nugget um, for them. And, and that is all Dr. Aaron Zeller is doing. Uh, so I'll give him props for that. But the other piece that I was going to share with you too is, as I mentioned, this is kind of a pilot program in this relatively small residency program. So what we've been doing uh, to kind of inform Form us from the facilitation or development standpoint is the other piece that they do when they go into ethos and capture their teaching pearl and, and get their credit and everything is we're actually asking them to evaluate the program every time they go in. So they have the same three questions from an evaluation standpoint about the program, um, thinking about, you know, is this meeting the objectives that you that we set forth for the program? Um, what has been helpful for you thus far, what is not helpful, you know, so sort of like kind of like recommending changes. And so we on the back end can look at this and say, oh, okay, so now we have this information that we might need to do this part a little bit differently as we continue to move forward. So it's real-time feedback to the facilitators, right. to the program developers, so that we can make real-time changes to the program as needed based on the participants' feedback. Process evaluation as well as outcomes, right? It's, yep. it's summative and formative evaluation. It's the difference <laughs> between the cook tasting the soup and the guests tasting the soup. Yes. Right? And there will be a summative evaluation at the very end when we're all done. Of um, course. Of course. We'll ask them to kind of reflect on their experience overall. Wow. Um, so that'll, that'll be at the end. So it's a, they've been so gracious in, in letting us kind of really do this, uh, in an in-depth way to kind of glean as much as we can from this opportunity. And who knows, we might be able to kind of spread the love and carry this out in other residency programs well, in our market area. So that's we'll going to be a no, a no brainer. I mean, kudos to you and to the USC culture, and to all the leadership, you know, the Angela Sharkey, the Allison McGregor, the da- daughter Ray. Aaron Zeller. Don't forget Aaron Zeller. Oh, this I'm was- getting down to him. I was going on case. <laughs> <laughs> well, Z is at the end anyway. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. So that's right, Zeller. So yeah, what a culture there of creativity and allowing people the freedom to do things, to experiment with things. And to just take chances on like, well, that sounds like a lot of work and we already have that. Why are you going to bother messing with it? We got a great program. What's the RTP for me? Why are you messing with that? Make it, no one's going to want to commit to a five-week program and doing a project. Nobody's got time to do that. You know, just give them what they need to know. Wow. You, you've demonstrated that that model um, and the approach of teaching people what they need to learn that they can literally take and yeah. into a fill in the blank versus three ring binders full of information and zip drives full of information that they have to then spend six months absorbing and debriefing mm-hmm. what it is they learned and then figure out how to apply it. Cause then, you know, we're never going to do it. Right. That zip drive application apply. day one. Exactly. I love that application day one. Oh, Penny. So good. See, <laughs> you're right where you were meant to be. I'm excited to be here. Well, and and they are very fortunate to have you here. And so, again, what a great lesson and a life story. And you shared it so honestly. And I just, it's so inspirational to me because, again, for so, so many faculty right now around the world are struggling. We're in really hard times. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of fatigue and despair and really like reevaluating why am I here? What am I doing? I why did I even, where's the promise of academic medicine? It's just too, it's too tough. It's too hard. And yet here's a a, a good example. Penny Edwards, relationship building, uh, all the faculty affairs and faculty development, we're building relationships and as are all of us. And I think the most important relationship is building that relationship with ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And trusting that we have everything we need right inside of us. And all it takes is having a couple friends there to help you pull it out, amplify it, you know, oh, maximize yeah. it. Oh, 
Penny, so good. Anything you'd like to leave us with before we end this episode today? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I, I think I, I uh, am definitely grateful for the opportunity to, to be here with you, Kim. I, I appreciate it very much. And and to to all of our, our faculty development and faculty affairs colleagues out there, you know, just one day at a time, mm-hmm. you know, one day at a time. And sometimes it's really one hour at a time. And that's OK, because we all kind of have each other's backs. And we're all supporting each other as we engage in this uh, relationship building enterprise that is faculty development and faculty affairs. Penny Edwards. Thank you so much. And for you, to you for listening, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and learned as much from Miss Edwards as I did. USC Greenville, very fortunate to have Penny there. If you want to be in the podcast, just send me an email facultyfactorykim at gmail.com, facultyfactorykim at gmail.com. Or if you know somebody else who we should have on here to teach us something, just send them my way. Again, everybody, thanks so much. Join us next time. And thanks to Penny Edwards. Bye, Penny. Thank you. Bye. Hello, Faculty Factory listeners. It's your friendly podcast producer here, Casey Callanan. Just to remind you, if you didn't already know it, the Faculty Factory is now offering coaching. You can learn more by visiting facultyfactory.org slash coaching. Faculty Factory Coaching is about building a thriving clinical, educational, and research career to be successful beyond all your expectations. Most of all, it's about living a joy-filled life. To learn more about Faculty Factory Coaching, drop us a line over at facultyfactory.org front slash coaching, and you can learn more there. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.